All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Whirling. I am a solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. And I'm not going to lie, I am a little nervous this morning. So uh, if you could please uh, humor me, I'd like to tell a joke. Um, so what did the man say when he ran into the unicorn at the party? Ouch. All right, thank you. <laughs> Feel much better now. Um, so, <laughs> um, so today we're actually going to be talking about a topic that is uh, actually rather near and dear to my heart. So um, I do a lot of work at Amazon in the machine learning space. Uh, I actually was at the machine learning booth today, uh, yesterday, and I'll be there this afternoon. So feel free to come by and say hi if you have any questions. Um, but prior to coming to Amazon, I was actually uh, in the Air Force. I attended the Air Force Academy and actually built a, satellite, a payload that was on a satellite, uh, the FalconSat satellite. Um, and I also studied satellite communications in grad school. So um, satellites are really important because they give us the ability to look at the world on a macro level. Um, we can look at uh, large swaths of the Earth and do more advanced mapping. We can track things like climate change and natural disasters and do assessments of natural disasters within our world. And so it's really cool what the work that Digital Globe has been doing using Amazon SageMaker to bring machine learning into this problem and being able to do much more advanced analytics and analysis on these imagery. Um, so that's what we're really going to focus on in the conversation today. Um, let me go to the next chart. All right, so to kind of set the stage, I'm going to talk a lot about um, the AWS machine learning stack and machine learning at AWS in general. Um, from there, we're really going to focus on Amazon SageMaker because uh, Digital Globe has built out their GBDX platform, which is actually using SageMaker under the hood to allow customers to do analysis on their imagery and actually incorporate machine learning um, using a lot of uh, Digital Globe's images that they have available today. Choo. All right, so machine learning at AWS. So we've been doing machine learning um, for, for a bit now. Um, in fact, uh, you know, since Amazon.com really came online over 10 years ago, we've been doing um, things like personalized recommendations, which is why when I go shopping for a sleeping bag, I end up with a tent and a grill and everything else I didn't need. Um, so that's being powered by machine learning. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, fulfillment automation and inventory management. So our actual warehouses are leveraging machine learning to optimize where we're placing items within the warehouse. Um, we actually have our uh, Prime Air initiative, which is very cool. Uh, we're actually looking on or asking the question of how can we automate the delivery of packages by leveraging technologies like drones. Uh, Amazon Alexa, so that's a lot of natural language processing applications. Um, the voice assistant is very cool. That's where I got my sweet joke from. Uh, and Amazon Go, so if you guys haven't heard of Amazon Go, um, it's very cool. Our flagship store is in Seattle, but we're also opening more stores throughout the country. And it really is a completely different shopping experience because there is no checkout. You walk into the store through a turnstile, you grab what you need off the shelves, you put it in a bag, and you walk out. Uh, my friends, we all joke, it kind of feels like a glorified form of stealing. But that really is being powered by machine learning. So we have um, cameras in there that are tracking customers as they walk through the store. We have sensors that are tracking what they're picking up off of the shelves. And so it actually is very accurate. Um, so definitely check that out. If you're ever in the Seattle area, I highly recommend it. So the way that we've built out our machine learning stack is we're looking at how can we bring these technologies that we've built internally to our customers. And to do that, we really want to be able to reach developers of all different skill levels. So you don't have to be real deep in data science to be able to take advantage of our machine learning platform on AWS. So the way we structure things, we really have like three tiers that our applications tend to fall into. Uh, we have the application services, and these are going to come to you pre-built and pre-packaged. They interface with you through an API. So these are services like, uh, I'll have it on the next chart too, but recognition or natural language processing services like Comprehend and Translate. Um, the next layer down is going to be our platform services. And these are going to have a lot of the infrastructure that's managed for you. So say you need to build a custom model because the application services don't meet your specific needs. You can still use the platform services and not have to worry about the infrastructure beneath that. So they help streamline the process for you. But of course, some customers out there do want to do um, very advanced work and need to be able to fully customize their environment. So there's always the option to deploy the instances directly into your VPC and actually um, install the algorithms and the frameworks on top of that. So here's the stack broken out. Um, again, we have our application services. So there's Amazon recognition, which is going to be our object detection, scene detection, facial analysis. 
We have our translate, transcribe, and poly, which are going to be doing a lot more with natural language processing. So the ability to translate between languages, go from speech to text, text to speech. Uh, we have our comprehend, which is going to be our text analytics. And then Amazon Lex, which is also the same engine, the engine that is powering Amazon Alexa today. And then uh, kind of jumping down here with the frameworks and interface layer, um, that we, what we have there is, of course, our P3 instances. And those are powered by our NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs. And on top of that, you can deploy a deep learning AMI, which will have all of the major machine learning frameworks installed for you. Um, so it's a really convenient way to get started whenever you're building something a little bit more custom. But today, we're going to take the time to really emphasize Amazon SageMaker. And that's where I want to spend a lot of the discussion today on. Um, so Amazon SageMaker was released in reInvent 2017. And it's really built to help streamline the delivery process of getting a model built and then put into production in your environment. So whenever you start the process of building a machine learning model, there's, always, there's quite a few steps involved. So, and along the way, many customers end up not being able to get their model into production because they're constantly hitting against these barriers. Uh, you know, the first big step is collecting the data. You know, what data do I need to answer this problem that I have? You know, from there, you need to go ahead and say, OK, now I have my data. What algorithm works on that? And then you have to stand up a whole environment so you can test against those. Then there's the whole issue of tuning that model and training that model and doing all the tweaking. And then, of course, deploying it into production. But then once it's in production, how do we ensure that it can scale to meet our needs as they change over time? So SageMaker is actually a, built out to be a modular infrastructure. It has three key components. The first one is, of course, building. So you can use a pre-built uh, Jupyter Notebook. So if you go into the SageMaker console, you can just click Start Notebook Instance, and that will open up for you. And you can start um, just typing away and programming in there. Right now, it supports uh, TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, and Chainer. And we're constantly adding new algorithms. PyTorch is actually very new. It came out as of yesterday. Um, so if you have something beyond those, though, you can always go ahead and use a container and then leverage SageMaker for training and deploying. Uh, it also has a variety of pre-built algorithms that allow you to quickly experiment without having to manage the code yourself. Um, so we have very popular ones like K-means, PCA, LDA, XGBoost. Uh, we have image classification algorithms in there. So whenever you're you know, tackling that problem and figuring out which types of models make sense, you can always swap those out and sort of plug and play and, and see which one's going to give you the best performance. And once you find one that's optimal, you have the option of either then tuning that or you can go down a more custom route that dives deeper into that model. But it gives you the freedom to really do that first pass of, of what makes sense for my data. So once you have that first piece, you have it built, you have your model built, you're ready to go. Um, SageMaker has nice features in there that allow you to more easily train your models. So you can do one-click training. It really is just one line of code. So again, if you guys want to come by the booth later, I will show you. I've, it truly is one line of code. And it's going to package your code, deploy a training instance, train, save off the model artifacts, and then tear down that instance when it's done. And you're going to be billed by the second for that. So if you think about how you had to do it before. So I wanted to go and train a machine learning model that did segmentation on the SpaceNet data set. I would have to go launch P3 instance, load the data onto the P3 instance. I would put the deep learning AI on there. I would go do my experimentation. I would build it. And all this time, I'm being billed for this P3 instance, which can be rather expensive. With SageMaker, I can use a T2 medium, which is more like four cents an hour. And then whenever I train, I'll spin up that P3 and train. And whenever it's done, it'll save my artifacts for me and tear down that cluster. So it, it ends up resulting in some very significant cost savings there. And we also recently launched the uh, hyperparameter tuning feature, too. So for anyone that's had to build a machine learning model, you know there's lots of, of knobs that you have to twist. Um, so the hyperparameter tuning upper, um, algorithm will actually help optimize that for you. So you'll set in ranges of values that you're look, interested in looking at. You'll set a budget for how much you want to spend tuning. And the algorithm will go in and try to make smart decisions to help you achieve a more optimal model more quickly. And finally, we have the deployment stage. Uh, and this is probably one of my favorite features of Amazon SageMaker, because if anyone had to package a model before into a container and create an endpoint and deploy it into production, uh, for folks who have a stronger data science background, it, it really is non-trivial. It's, it's difficult for a lot of us to learn. Um, so whenever I got to use SageMaker the first time, and I knew that it was, it was really that one click, right, that one line of code, and I could have my model packaged and deployed into my environment, it was so much easier. It was a huge relief. Uh, in addition to that, 
the deployment stage also has some really nice features, like the ability to do A-B testing. So you can actually have up to five different models into your environment at the same time, and you can choose how much traffic you want to route to each of those models for inference. It also does endpoint auto-scaling, so whenever it launches that endpoint, you can go ahead and set a min and a max amount of instances that you want to have, and then it will scale based on the traffic coming in. So it really does make that management of the endpoint in your production environment much more seamless. All right, so that's all I have. I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Nate Ricklin from Digital Globe, and he's going to talk about some of the amazing things that Digital Globe is doing with Amazon SageMaker. So Nate, welcome. Thanks. All right. Got it. Thank you. All right, thanks for having me here. Let me tell you uh, a quick 30,000 foot view of Digital Globe, maybe in fact a 500 kilometer view. Ha ha ha. Um, so we've launched seven satellites in space. Um, we've got five up there in orbit right now, um, flying around the world, taking pictures every day. Uh, and if you haven't heard of us, uh, Digital Globe does a lot to power your daily mobile digital life. So if you've ever looked for an address on your phone, um, if you've ever called up an Uber, looked at a trailhead uh, on, on this Mapbox app, then you have either looked directly at our data or you've used apps that are powered by our data. But we do more than just enable your, your digital life. Um, we try to do a lot of good in the world as well. So for example, we used this image to, uh, we gave it to the Associated Press, and they used it to link these two fishing, uh, illegal fishing boats with slaves on them to this commercial refrigeration ship that had turned off its AIS beacon and was kind of hiding out for a few days. And we caught it on a picture, gave it to the Associated Press, and they wrote a bunch of stories about it and ended up freeing 2,000 slaves as a result of that investigation. Um, we're helping to eradicate polio and malaria in Africa by mapping villages that there are simply no maps for. So medicine and uh, vaccines can get to where the people are. And we give first responders uh, before and after imagery of natural disasters so they know what's going on on the ground. This is a picture of the of the wildfires in California earlier this year. But we need to do more. So we're launching way more satellites. We're launching multiple constellations of new satellites. If you take a look at this picture, this little, this little diagram up here, um, it's kind of a diagram at the top of when we can take pictures today with our satellites. Right now, we've got five satellites in polar sun synchronous orbit, so they're flying around the globe like this. And then as the sunshade line comes around, they kind of stay in the same place, local time. So they always get a picture of the same time, local time. That's clustered around 11 a.m. or so. Except for World V1, which we pushed off to like 2 p.m. so we can get a little bit more uh, coverage over the day. Well, with multiple new constellations, we're, we're launching these satellites in, in uh, wonky angular orbits. I believe that's the technical term. <laughs> uh, and that means we're going to get 20 to 30 minute revisits over a certain spot, super high frequency, uh, up to 40 images per day. And what that means is that we need to go way, way faster in pulling information out of these pixels. There's just not enough people looking at pixels that by the time the next image comes in, uh, we've gotten what we need out of the previous image. So we need to use machines. We need to use AI. Uh, but we can't do it all ourselves. It takes an ecosystem of, of partners. So we've built the GBDX platform to be a place where that ecosystem can come together. So we've got you know, a bunch of these logos on the screen. A bunch of them are algorithm producers. They bring their algorithm to GBDX, so they plug it in. Uh, some of them are algorithm consumers. They run their own algorithms or they run other people's algorithms and run them at scale against our imagery and extract the information that they need. So our goal is really to make to, to, to advance the state of the art of AI on satellite imagery. We, we can't do it all ourselves. So how are we doing that? Number one, we are making better and easier access than ever before to our pixels. They've been locked up on-prem, on tape drives. We're getting them out into the cloud. We are making them easily accessible, easily consumable to people who are non-GIS. Uh, and then we're building AI tools to make it really easy to develop AI against our imagery. So I'll start with access. 
This is a selfie from space. Uh, this is our headquarters out in uh, Colorado. And it looks like a satellite dish on our building. It's not. It's just a happy coincidence. It's a really cool building. Uh, and over there on the left side of the image, you see this little white container uh, box looking thing. That's the very first AWS snowmobile about a year and a half ago. And we plugged it into our data center and we loaded our 100 petabyte archive off of all of our tape drives onto the snowmobile. And then uh, a couple of months later, after loading all of this data last year, the snowmobile unplugged, drove off to Amazon, and forever liberated our data from the jail of our tape archive and into the cloud. And of course, we need two copies. Um, so we drove to US West, or we didn't drive it, but the, the truck drove to US West, took a right turn, and went to another region, AWS region. And we've got our data in, in Glacier and S3, and that gives us the durability that we need, uh, that we are contractually obligated to have to keep our data safe. Another way we are um, opening up access to our data, I have to, I have to throw a shout out here to our Digital Globe Open Data Program. And what we do is for natural disasters, uh, we, we put out pre-event and post-event imagery um, and some vector data sets too. We have a crowdsourcing platform and we open it up to our public crowd to come and look for damaged buildings or missing buildings or flooded roads, things like that. And these vector sets are also freely available online. So if you go to digitalglobe.com slash open data, you can get access to this stuff. And if you click on, you, you know, you can see there's a huge list of, of, uh, of events going on all the time. And if you click on one, you'll get like a dozen images before and after. Uh, so this is all open online um, for free. Uh, it's Creative Commons 4.0 license. So, you know, go play with that, go use that. And then finally, uh, this is where I'm going to get into the real meat and get a little bit technical in this presentation. Uh, I want to talk about our raster data access service, um, which is RDA is what we call it. Um, and this is our system, our service, that gives us real-time random access to all of the pixels in our 18-year archive of, of the Earth. So the way it works is we've got data sitting on S3 over on the left. Uh, we've got our own archive data. Um, Amazon also nicely puts Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 for free, so that's cool. Uh, the key here is that this data has to be in, a, in some kind of random access or cloud-optimized format. So cloud-optimized GeoTIFF works great. Uh, we happen to have our own way of chopping up uh, images and putting them as separate objects in S3, but we're kind of agnostic to what that format is. You can even bring your own cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, stick it in a bucket, and point RDA at it. That works too. That works well. And then over on the right side, this is our service layer. And it's a, a RESTful endpoint on the very end. And it's a real-time kind of graph deferred processing chain. So there's all kinds of optimizations happening. All of these operations are squashed into one, so there's no disk or memory in between all these operations. And what, what happens is you make a REST request at the end uh, for a little chunk of imagery processed in some way, something like that. And then it propagates backwards, figures out what data it needs out of S3, and in this example, it's pulling a little bit of multispectral, a little bit of uh, uh, panchromatic imagery, orthorectifying them, uh, pan sharpening them together into one better, sharper image, doing some dynamic range adjustment, doing some tweaking, and then finally coming out of your endpoint and producing an image chip like you see uh, on the bottom right right there. So RDA is the basis of data access for GBDX. It's the basis of data access for all of our AI tools that we're building out. And here's kind of another, another way to look at it, just a little bit more detail about RDA. Um, this picture here is a, just a development tool that we use. Um, and you, you can kind of see, you can drag and drop these graph nodes around. We have a library of uh, uh, hundreds of operators that you can drag in and connect them. All the nodes are parameterized. They all have sources of a, of a previous node, for example. And the way it works is you create the graph you want, and it's JSON defined. It's RESTful API, so you define in JSON or via this GUI or some client library and say, cool, here's my graph. And then you say, I want to consume data out of this particular node. So that's what you're seeing on the right. We, we chose a node. We're displaying it on a slippy map. And We've developed a couple of client libraries to make 
RDA a little bit easier to use. Um, we've built a Python API. Um, this is called GBDX Tools. Um, you can, it's open source. You can go Conda install GBDX Tools. I wish you could pip install it, but there's GDAL and like Raster.io and all kinds of stuff that pip doesn't work happily with. So Conda install GBDX Tools, get that. And there's a GDAL driver. So GDAL 2.3 or above um, knows about RDA. And if you have GBDX credentials, you can um, say, you know, configure GDAL to point at a particular node of a particular graph and just do like a GDAL translate, get the data locally, or just do whatever processing that streams out of the cloud as you access it. So we've got pixels. We've got pixels any way we want them. Uh, let me show you a few examples now of our Python client library and just accessing imagery. So what we're looking at here on the top, there's a little couple snippets of Python. Um, we've got a catalog ID that we care about. Um, we're grabbing the multispectral bands. We've got a, a small AOI that we care about. And we just want to produce this image. So it comes to the screen. And it's all, this, all, this, all the processing is happening server side on the way to the client here. So um, data getting pulled off of S3, um, orthorectification, that's about all that's going on in this one. And then it's showing up in your client. But this image is too hazy. I don't like it. I want to run atmospheric compensation. So say A comp equals true. Now the image is really nice looking. Um, a simple parameter tweak in our, in our client code, what's really happening on the back end is the graph is changing nodes of where it's pulling data from or inserting a new node in between that's running a comp between a couple of other operators. Uh, but it's not sharp enough. I want to pan sharpen it. So that's really easy. Run pan sharp equal or band type is pan sharp. Now the, the, the multispectral and the pan chromatic are combined together to give you a better fidelity image. And you can do some fancier stuff too. Um, server side, we can run all the classical uh, remote sensing kind of operations that, that everybody knows about. This is NDVI. The red is uh, vegetation. It's kind of a chlorophyll detector, sort of. And by the way, all of this is happening in GBX notebooks. I, I made all these examples in GBX notebooks, which is a product that we announced and launched at reInvent last year up on the main stage. And we went GA with it just a few weeks ago. So you can go and sign up for free. And you can play with examples like this one. You can search and find this example or other examples and tweak them and change them and use different AOIs and different techniques or whatever you want to do and, and just run it. And you can swipe your credit card and get access to more and more imagery as well. We can't just give it all away for free. All right, so we've got access nailed. Um, that's how we're serving up access to our pixels. Uh, there's a lot of different options. We don't want to pigeonhole anybody into one particular way of doing it. Uh, and so now let's talk about how we're enabling the AI ecosystem um, by building tools to use on top of that imagery. So back to RDA, um, we have integrated SageMaker with RDA. And we've done this in the most naive and simple way to, to kind of to see if it works. It turns out it works really well, so we're pretty happy with it. Uh, we made a SageMaker operator inside RDA. It's the yellow one. Um, and what we've done is uh, all it does is, you know, the imagery propagates through these different graph nodes. And then it just calls out to a SageMaker endpoint where a SageMaker model is deployed. And the data goes there. And then the result comes back. It's all synchronous. And then continues on through the graph. And what I really like about this is the interface with SageMaker, both the API interface with SageMaker and then the, the model Docker interface for getting your trained model into SageMaker. And the reason I like it is that we didn't build it. Amazon built it. So Amazon made the documentation. Amazon made all the examples. Amazon made all the tutorials. Some bloggers out there are going to show examples, and everybody's going to go and learn about that. We don't have to do any of that work, which is awesome. And when our customers have problems or need to learn how to do this and we want to get them to plug their algorithms into RDA, we just say, hey, go look at all this Amazon documentation. So that's pretty cool. Um, let me show you some examples. So back to our Jupyter Notebook. Um, this time, there's a graph here that, does, that hits SageMaker in the loop and does building segmentation. 
Um, we've got a trained building segmentation model, um, and we've plugged it into SageMaker, and this is pulling from RDA. Um, and it's all happening server side, so the client here is not doing anything, we're just viewing what's coming off the server. So let's take a look at this on some slippy maps and see how fast it really works. Might need to, to click a button in the back or something to get this to go. Maybe I can do it. Oh, nope. Here. Yeah, so we're looking at a graph on the left where there's an image coming in off S3. We're doing some tweaking and band selection and stuff like that, and then sending it to our SageMaker endpoint where it's finding building segments, and those are coming back as these kind of red blobs. So I'm zooming around, panning around, and in real time, the imagery is streaming in, and the building segments are streaming in at the same time. All happening server side, all on SageMaker. This is actually, uh, we've set this up right now with only one SageMaker node, so it's not even auto-scaling. We haven't done any optimization like multiple subdomains pointing at the same thing so your browser goes faster or anything like that, and it's, it's kind of pleasingly fast. We're pretty happy with it so far. Uh, here's just another example. We did a, a quick and dirty airplane detector that we threw together and trained up and threw onto SageMaker. And this is running on really bad black and white cloudy imagery, but these little gray blobs you'll see as I pan around are the detected airplanes in real time as I pan the map around. Um, I think I'll zoom way out here and you'll see like some, some tiles start to kind of flow in and detection start to flow in. So we're hoping that this speed really enables um, AI developers, data scientists to develop their models faster, right? The whole point is to get the dev cycle faster. All right, here's another even fancier one. Uh, we've got two SageMaker models in the loop here. Um, we have two different images, 2016, 2008, and the red blobs are supposed to be buildings that are new, that are not in the old image. And it kind of works, it's kind of cool. Um, we've got two SageMaker models, we're finding buildings on both images, and then kind of doing a diff on them and showing the result. But it's not perfect. Here's an example where it thought there was, a, there was no building in 2008, I think, but there really was. Um, and that's why we need you. We need everyone in the community to come and, and iterate with us and help advance the state of the art of AI on satellite imagery together. So what are we doing next? This is kind of the cycle uh, that, a, that an AI or a data scientist goes through when they're given a job, like, find all the buildings in Africa. I'm like, okay, um, first we need a lot of training data, and that's the hardest part. Um, the training data has to be super high quality, and you need a lot of it, and that's, that ends up being really expensive. Uh, we spend a lot of time drawing little boxes that are perfect on imagery and trying to outsource that, trying to train you know, lesser skilled people to do that kind of stuff, and it's very expensive. So. At Digital Globe, one of the first things we're doing is building a gigantic training data repository. And we think we can do a pretty good job because we've got our whole archive that goes back 18 years covering the whole planet. So we're really hoping we can have an impact here and fill this up and, and help all of you get bootstrapped on training data when you're, when you're starting to train models on satellite imagery. Then the next thing is, is once you've got your training data, you've got to train your model. Um, but I don't think it's quite as simple as saying, hey, training data repository, uh, SageMaker, go talk to each other and train up. Um, a lot of more complicated stuff happens in between there. Uh, and what typically happens is a, a data scientist will want to augment or, or kind of fuzz and change up and rotate and add noise and all this stuff to their, to their training data to try to make their model more robust or even make completely synthetic training data. Maybe take 3D models of airplanes and kind of rotate them in different ways with different shadows and put those over satellite imagery, things like that. So it's not as simple as just having some training data, some reference training data, really, because it's, it's part of the trick is how you mess with it before you go train with it. So we think notebooks is a good candidate for that. Um, define what you want to do in code 
We're never going to be able to just plug the two together in a general way. So it's going to have to be done with code. So notebooks is the, is the gap filler there. And then we train with SageMaker, obviously. Deploy with SageMaker and into RDA. That's super easy. That's done. And then you get instant feedback on how your model is doing. And we're building out um, a set of curation tools for easy viewing of, of trained models, uh, for easy painting of places where it worked well, so that can go become good training data, painting of places where it was bad, so that can become your negative training data, uh, doing some kind of hard negative mining type stuff. Uh, and we're hoping that you know, doing all these things that work independently, we don't want to force anybody into any one um, pattern. We don't know the right pattern, but we think all these tools will help, right? So we want to put these out there, make as many of them as possible open source, and kind of follow along and see what people use and, and see what patterns people use and learn from that and go from there. And then hopefully we advance the state of the art of AI on satellite imagery together. That's about all I got. Do your session survey. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Thanks. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you've got a question, please just raise your hand and we'll bring you a, uh, a microphone. Hey, how's it going? Can you talk about uh, any of the work that you're doing with the federal government? I saw it's one of the clients you had up on the screen. Yeah, we're doing lots of work with the federal government. I don't know how much I can talk about, but we're doing tons and tons of machine learning, of, of uh, finding all kinds of different objects in all kinds of different places as the satellite imagery comes in. Um, it's pretty cool. I don't know how much I can say about it, though. Hi. So theoretically, you can get pretty detailed, right? You can go, how, how, how much detail can you zoom on down? Because I'm thinking you are helping, God bless them, our Department of Defense identify enemy combatants. Yeah, we can get, uh, our satellites are 30 centimeter. Our best ones are 30 centimeter. So that's about a square foot. You can, you can see a person walking around. They're kind of a blob, but you can see a person and their shadow pretty well. And we have some pretty interesting new techniques. We're actually using machine learning to enhance our imagery to kind of get synthetic 15 centimeter. What we're finding really interesting about that is that it actually makes deep learning and AI work better on our data. Um, so we might end up just kind of using AI to enhance the data and then using AI to find stuff in the data. Uh, that might be the thing that we do in the future. It's a question for Kate. Uh, uh, so when you do training, can you also scale it? Like if I need more than one P3, if I do want to do data parallelism to train like um, TensorFlow with like millions of data, can I do scale training? Uh, whenever you initiate your training job, you will set the size of the instance that you want to train with. So you have the option of choosing um, any of our P3 instances. You also have P2s, or if you want to use M's or C's. Um, so you'll select what instance type you want to train on. Um, you can also do distributed training, but that's going to depend on, of course, the model and the algorithm that you're using. So it'll have to be uh, compatible with distributed training first. Um, with our SageMaker algorithms that we have canned, it will tell you in the documentation whether or not you can do distributed training with that. Uh, but it does not automatically scale. You will set that before you start the training job. Okay. Uh, a couple slides ago, you had a, a, something that really interest, interested me, which was your pipeline. And then, oh, by the way, you could interface with SageMaker. I really like that. I uh, had a question on that, because in real life for detection, um, you could have the, you know, the pipeline go off to you with one little chip of 512 or 512. But in reality, that's not how it happened. You would actually get maybe the chips around you, you would run detection uh, with a maybe 0.2 overlap, and then you do non-maximal suppression, whatever, and then you really narrow it down to say, here's where the ROIs are, and, and you put the blobs around there. But, but you just, I'm, I'm sure in that one, you were just sending each one off, and he's like, okay, what do, what do I see there? In a vacuum, it's hard. You couldn't tell if something at the corner was yeah. really cement or not. You'd really need to know a little more, and so that's why you have these, these roving windows. 
is there a way to rig it up so you, it's not just each little chip, but I get at least a collection? Yeah, yeah, you're right. On this particular model, we just threw the chip and got you know the same chip back with some segmentations. We've thought about that, and there's some parameter in here for putting a gutter around whatever size you want, so you can do whatever you want. Hi, good morning. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think, a 20-minute revisit time, but I was wondering how quickly is the data available via the RDA, and is that a premium service in order to be able to get more real-time data? Yeah, it's on the order of 20 minutes, half an hour, as, that's as fast as it can get. Depends on where the satellite is and how close it is to downlinking, and then how you know, fast you can process that. And is, it is definitely a premium service. We charge a lot to our customers who want it as fast as possible. Um, most of what we do with AI on satellite imagery and our analytics customers is on the archive, the exhaust of all that real-time stuff that's happening where you know, people care about minutes and hours. Um, but it's getting faster and faster, and it's going to continue to get faster. Question in the back. Um, can you give us an idea as you're processing um, in the training models uh, the type of performance? Is it dependent on how many algorithms are being uh, used concurrently, or uh, you know, what, what kind of performance would come out of a training model? In terms of training? Yeah, um, so we're not, we don't, we haven't tackled training yet. Um, we've actually found that, you know, our data scientists that we have, data scientists that we partner with, a lot of them still choose to go buy some GPU rigs and put them in their garage. Um, so we're hoping that the ease of use of SageMaker and the speed and the integration with all the tools we have also in the cloud make that more appealing. Um, and maybe it will cost the same, maybe it will cost a little bit more, but maybe it's easy enough and fast enough and seamless enough to make sense in terms of cost um, when you're training. Okay, I got a question for Kate. Um, it's about the SageMaker. I've seen a lot of people talking about like AI things, it's more related to the image processing, something like that but we want to do something different, for example, collecting user behavior data when they visit our website or something like that and use these things to process and give users more better search feedback or something like that. Is SageMaker capable of doing that? Yes, yeah, so with SageMaker, you're not limited to any one type of algorithm. Um, you have the ability to bring in any code you want um, you can build models within the SageMaker notebook itself if you want to go that route, but you also have the option of bringing in models that have been packaged into a container. And we do have example notebooks out there to show you how to package your containers properly that SageMaker knows uh, where to enter your code and actually begin executing. So you're not limited to any kind of image classification or detection type algorithms. Uh, we have plenty of customers out there who are doing natural language processing, uh, time series forecasting, and, and many other things out there. So, so you're definitely not limited in that sense. See, that's why this interface is awesome. I didn't even have to answer that question. <laughs> okay, uh, the question is, could I pull something that's less processed from, uh, from the archive if I don't want R35 unsharpened or uh, do something else and then just take the, I don't know, seven bands of raw data and pull it into the SageMaker? Absolutely, you can do that. Can you elaborate a bit more on the cost of such, um, I mean, infrastructure cost of such service, let's say, for that building detection to train the model and then to do this auto scaling and stuff? I mean, are these dollars just uh, flying around or this is very cheap? Yeah, so we, we haven't tackled training quite yet. So we, we hope to use SageMaker, like I mentioned before, because it's a seamless experience. In terms of inference, we don't have a good handle on the actual cost. Um, it's, we've spun up a few instances. actually. One of the things I want to bring up, if there's AWS people in the room, um, we've, and, and like I said, we have SageMaker models deployed on one instance at a time right now. So it's not auto-scaling, it's one GPU node, and it's just alive all the time, right? And for a different model, it's a different GPU node. It's the way SageMaker is set up. 
And that's really bad, right? I'd like there to be a one auto-scaling cluster of GPU nodes that can run all the models that I have available. Maybe I want 500 different models available in SageMaker to hit, and I want to be able to auto-scale independently of which, which of those I'm hitting at a time. So feature requests for AWS. Right, uh, we don't have a good handle on the cost yet. Um, for RDA, it's, we're using ECS, so it's just a bunch of auto-scaling nodes. I think we use like uh, some C5 type nodes. Um, they auto-scale based on load, based on various things. Uh, hello. You mentioned RDA and, and, and kind of briefly mentioned the ability to bring your own data. Uh -huh. um, I'm wondering, have you worked at all with the, um, the, the environmental science data where they tend to favor NetCDF and HDF rather than uh, TIFF? Uh, I, I don't know, not quite yet. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with it, but in principle, anything available in S3 or anywhere, it doesn't really have to be S3, but some kind of uh, random access format where I can get a geographic chunk of the image at a time, that's what matters, right? Um, so it, it, it can't be zipped, it can't be like a regular GeoTIFF where it's sort of you know, one line at a time in the file. Um, if it's cloud optimized and if it's accessible to the internet, then we should be able to do it. I don't know if we can get that stuff natively right now, but it's, it hasn't been a lot of work to add new things. Um, are any of the models that you have right now on SageMaker available for um, doing transfer learning on, or are they just available for inference? Right now, they're just available for inference, and our own internal teams are using them to do transfer learning, and they've actually done transfer learning from other different models that are out there. Um, so you know, the ones I'm showing right now are not really available for public consumption. Um, they're, they're, they're demos. But you know, we encourage everyone to plug in to SageMaker, use RDA, sign up, um, do all that stuff. OK, any further questions? Are we going to open source it? I would love to open source everything. And I would love to open source all of our data. But that's from a perspective of I want AI and satellite imagery to be really good. Unfortunately, Digital Globe has to pay to build and launch satellites, and that's really expensive. So we can't give away all of our data, maybe some. Um, and we will certainly open source as many of these tools as we can. Yeah. OK, thanks very much. Could I have a round of applause for Kate and Nate? Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, both of you.